today at the National Press Club, Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles. Minister Miles will use the speech to release the new National Defence Strategy and Integrated Investment Program. Richard Miles with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac address. My name is David Crow. I'm the Chief Political Correspondent at the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and a director here at the club. Our guest today is Richard Miles, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Defence Minister. And the subject is the future of Australian defence capability. And the timing is critical. Today, as we gather and as we speak, um, officials have distributed two documents to some of the journalists here at the club. Um, the first of them being the National Defence Strategy and the second one being the Integrated Investment Program. The second document is all about the 10-year spending profile for defence. Hugely important issues today here. The Deputy Prime Minister is, as we know, passionate about defence. But it's not all he's done. Mr Miles entered Parliament in 2007, became Parliamentary Secretary for Industry and for Foreign Affairs before becoming Minister for Trade. He held the job of National Reconstruction for Labor in Opposition before returning to Defence. So that combination of Defence and Industry is central to what he's done. He's also passionate about his football team, the Geelong Cats. And I mention that just in case someone uses an AFL analogy in their question today, which has been known to happen here at the club. Thank you to all of you for being here today. We have, or we're honoured to have, the current Chief of Defence Force with us, previous Chief of Defence Force with us, and also the next Chief of Defence Force with us, as, many other, as well as many other federal officials in this space and diplomats. Thank you for joining us. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation on X, where our handle is at Press Club Ost, or you can use the hashtag NPC. Please join me in welcoming Richard Miles to the podium. Well, thank you, David. And can I <clears throat> begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people, their elders past and present. And as the Minister for Defence, I also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have served our nation in the past and continue to do so today. And it is a great honour to be back here at the National Press Club. On the 24th of April last year, the Albanese government released the National Defence Statement and the Defence Strategic Review. Commissioned in the first 100 days of government, the Defence Strategic Review set out a stark assessment of Australia's strategic circumstances and a bold agenda for necessary defence reform. The National Defence Statement said that, and I quote, a large-scale conventional and non-conventional military build-up without strategic reassurance is contributing to the most challenging circumstances in our region for decades. And the Defence Strategic Review observed, and I quote, as a consequence, for the first time in 80 years, we must go back to fundamentals to take a first principles approach as to how we manage and seek to avoid the highest level of strategic risk we now face as a nation, the prospect of major conflict in the region that directly threatens our national interest. The most complex strategic circumstances since the end of World War II has demanded the biggest reassessment of our strategic posture in 35 years foundational thinking about the fundamental task of the Australian Defence Force and what kind of an ADF we need to, to perform it. Over the last few decades, the ADF has been a balanced force, capable of undertaking a broad range of functions in a broad range of environments, be it participating in a multinational effort in Afghanistan led by others, through to leading regional missions ourselves in Timor-Leste or Solomon Islands. The essential thesis of the Defence Strategic Review demanded a shift from this balanced force to a focused force, 
there is now one job at hand, transforming our future capability such that Australia can resist coercion and maintain our way of life in a much less certain region and world. The ADF needs to be entirely focused on this. Now, of course, Australia is part of a larger world. The strategic landscape in the Indo-Pacific is intimately connected with the success of Ukraine in its efforts to resist Russian aggression. A threat to the freedom of navigation in the Red Sea is a threat to the freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. It is important that Australia plays its global part, and we are, and we will continue to do so. But equally, the call for focus means that we simply have to make the difficult decision to keep the vast bulk of our effort in our region. That is what the world would expect of us. It is what our ally, the United States, does expect of us. But far more significantly and importantly, it is where our national interest unambiguously lies. Indeed, to make any other call would be to ignore the defence strategic review at the first juncture and for Australia not to be taken seriously. Our nation has a growing economic connection to the world. Trade is an increasing part of our national income. In 1990, trade represented 32% of our GDP. By 2020, that had risen to 45% of our GDP. Most of this trade is with our region, China, Korea and Japan being three of our top five trading partners. The great bulk of it is by sea. We have key exposures. For example, at the beginning of this century, we satisfied most of our liquid fuel needs by refining locally sourced crude oil in one of the eight oil refineries which then operated in Australia. Today, there are just two refineries left. Around 80% of what they refine is imported crude oil. And today, around 85% of our liquid fuel needs are supplied by imported refined product, most of it from just three countries, Korea, Singapore and Malaysia. We are literally dependent on this sea line of communication. Our national security and our national prosperity are based on a stable, peaceful region where the global rules-based order is preeminent and is respected. Indeed, the rules of the road at sea are everything for us. When the rules-based order is under pressure, Australia is under pressure. And crucially, this narrative paints the picture of the geography of our national security, and it does not lie on the coastline of our continent. It lies much further afield. The invasion of Australia is an unlikely prospect in any scenario, precisely because so much damage can be done to our country by an adversary without ever having to step foot on Australian soil. Our national security actually lies in the heart of our region because the defence of Australia does not mean much without the collective security of the region in which we live. And so to give effect to the focus the Defence Strategic Review demands, it in turn recommended the development of an ADF with a much greater capacity to project. To contribute to regional security, we must be able to project, to resist the coercion that would come from the disruption of our sea lines of communication, we must be able to project and to defend Australia's interests in the geography-less domain of cyber, we must be able to project. Impactful projection through the full spectrum of proportionate response is our task. And we must be able to do this in a way which denies any adversary the ability to operate against Australia's interests, a strategy of denial. And building a defence force capable of this is now the Albanese government's historic mission. The Defence Strategic Review recommended that the process of intermittent defence white papers be abandoned for a more structured and regular process of strategic update 
and renewal. It proposed a biennial national defence strategy accompanied by a refreshed integrated investment program, defence's 10-year procurement plan. It asked for the first of these to be released in 2024, and today we are doing just that. The 2024 National Defence Strategy is an evolution of the 2023 Defence Strategic Review. The 2024 Integrated Investment Program is the first version of Defence's 10-year procurement plan since the Defence Strategic Review, and it looks very different to integrated investment programs of the past. Unsurprisingly, the National Defence Strategy reaffirms the complexity of our strategic circumstances. The optimistic assumptions that guided defence planning after the end of the Cold War are long gone. Our environment is characterised by the uncertainty and tensions of entrenched and increasing strategic competition between the United States and China. Large-scale war has returned to the European continent and conflict is once again gripping the Middle East. This competition is accompanied by an unprecedented conventional and non-conventional military build-up in our region, taking place without strategic reassurance or transparency. The effects of this military build-up are occurring closer to Australia than previously, including a competition for security partnerships in Australia's immediate region. The intensifying competition is creating an environment where the risk of miscalculation is more ominous and the consequences more severe. The National Defence Strategy states, and I quote, China has employed coercive tactics in pursuit of its strategic objectives, including forceful handling of territorial disputes and unsafe intercepts of vessels and aircraft operating in international waters and airspace in accordance with international law. Australia no longer has the luxury of a 10-year window of strategic warning time for conflict. The National Defence Strategy observes that the combined effect of this has seen our strategic environment deteriorate over the last 12 months. And against this strategic backdrop, the National Defence Strategy emphasises the need for impactful projection that can enable a strategy of denial which in turn is capable of deterring a potential adversary from projecting force against Australia. This includes the capability to hold the military assets of an adversary at risk at greater distance from our shores. Equally important, this strategy aims to ensure that Australia can work with our partners to help deter broader conflict in our region that would be disastrous for us all. And in this way, the government seeks to invest in a sustainable strategic balance in the Indo-Pacific, a balance where no state is militarily predominant and in which no state judges that the benefit of conflict might outweigh the risks. People are defence's most important asset. And like many other Australian industries, we face a profound workforce challenge. Between 2021 and 2022-23, defence achieved only 80% of its uniformed recruiting requirements. And when combined with a strong external labour market draw for our people, this has resulted in a shortfall of around 4,400 personnel today. Now, of course, we are focused on attracting and retaining the highly specialised and skilled workforce required to meet Defence's capability needs. And this is not easy in a highly competitive labour market with record low levels of unemployment. There have been fundamental shifts already to make Defence an employer of choice. We are investing more in the education of our ADF personnel through the Defence Assisted Study Scheme and have expanded the ADF Health Program to include additional services. We've also introduced $50,000 continuation bonuses to encourage personnel to stay in the ADF beyond their minimum service obligation requirements. 
The government acknowledges the importance of addressing cultural shortcomings within defence, including those highlighted in the 2020 Inspector General of the ADF Afghanistan inquiry. The government will also consider the findings of the forthcoming final report of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide, which will include informing strategies to improve defence's culture. And we've taken meaningful steps to address defence's workforce crisis, but there is more work to do to improve recruitment and retention and to ensure defence's workforce planning is informed by our capability requirements. Defence will undertake a new, comprehensive workforce plan that will be aligned with the National Defence Strategy and the Integrated Investment Program, one that will deliver an effective and achievable approach to workforce planning. This plan will look to how we can streamline recruiting processes and have them more focused on the skills that defence needs the most. It will look at ways we can retain existing personnel for longer. Significantly, it will look at how the ADF can recruit from a wider pool of people. And this means ensuring that defence reflects the full diversity of Australia, such that it is drawing on the talents of the entirety of Australian society. But like the defence forces of our friends and allies, we also need to look at ways in which we can recruit from among certain non-Australian citizens to serve in the ADF. As a government, we are committed to meeting the current and future needs of the defence workforce, whether that be our ADF, Australian Public Service or external workforce. The 2024 Integrated Investment Program is a complete rebuild of the Integrated Investment Programs of the past. While it contains more money, it also required the reprioritisation of $22.5 billion over the next four years and $72.8 billion over the decade. And it really is impossible to overstate the significance and difficulty of the task of rebuilding the Integrated Investment Program. And I particularly want to pay tribute to Vice Admiral David Johnston, our next Chief of Defence Force, who led this work and the dedicated team that supported him. The Integrated Investment Program accelerates spending on the critical capabilities that will enable the ADF to project. And front and centre is a 53 to $63 billion commitment over the next 10 years to acquire a nuclear powered submarine capability under the banner of AUKUS. This will see the first Australian flagged Virginia class submarine take its place in the Royal Australian Navy in the early 2030s. It will also see the establishment of the most high-tech manufacturing facility in the country and work commence on the building of the first of the Australian-built SSN AUKUS submarines. And these will start to roll off the production line at the Osborne Naval Shipyard in the early 2040s. A nuclear-powered submarine capability represents the biggest leap in Australia's military capability since the establishment of the Royal Australian Navy. More than any other capability, this platform will give an adversary pause for thought and hold their assets at risk further from our shores. Our future submarines define projection. In addition, 51 to $69 billion of investment will build and support the Navy's future surface combatant fleet and continuous naval shipbuilding. The six Hunter-class frigates will be the most capable anti-submarine warfare frigates in the world. The 11 general purpose frigates will ultimately see the size of our surface combatant fleet double to the largest fleet Australia will have operated since the Second World War. Together with the six large optionally crewed surface vessels, our Navy's vertical launch missile capacity will more than triple from around 200 cells to over 700 cells. We are a maritime trading island nation. And having the most capable Navy in our history will be at the heart of our projection and our strategy of denial. A key emphasis of the Defence Strategic Review and now the Integrated Investment Program is the investment in longer range strike and targeting. 
28 to $35 billion is being directed to this effort. A new range of missile systems will be integrated into our Navy's surface combatants, which includes Tomahawk, Evolved Sea Sparrow and Naval Strike missiles. Our Army will acquire 42 high mobility artillery rocket systems, which will be equipped with precision strike missiles and guided multiple launch rocket systems. And this will take Army's firing capacity from a tactical range of 30 kilometres today to operational and strategically relevant ranges beyond 500 kilometres and will be at the heart of the Army's new long range fires regiment. The Royal Australian Air Force will acquire longer range missiles for the Joint Strike Fighters, the Super Hornets and the Growlers. And these will variously include the long range anti-ship missile, the Joint Air to Surface Standoff Missile Extended Range and the Advanced Anti-Radiation Guided Missile Extended Range. Work will also continue on the development of hypersonic air launched weapons for employment on the Super Hornets. The war in Ukraine has placed in sharp relief the pressure on global defence industry in producing missiles. Accordingly, ensuring Australia has access to the required quantity of new long-range missiles will be greatly assisted <clears throat> by the establishment of a domestic guided weapons and ordnance manufacturing capability. Working closely with industry, the government is committing $16 to $21 billion over the next decade, including almost a quarter of that over the next four years, to see this industrial uplift become a reality. Defence is continuing to work with industry on initiatives to grow our domestic industrial base, building on recent commitments such as its $37.4 million contract with Lockheed Martin Australia, to commence manufacturing missiles in Australia from next year. The Australian Army <coughs> must become far more amphibious and mobile in order to be able to project and contribute to the collective security of our region. Investing in a more mobile army is central to the integrated investment program. Seven to $10 billion is being invested in over 26 new landing craft, both medium and heavy, which will transform the mobility of the Army, building on the restructure of the Army that was announced last year. The platform for Australia's projection is our northern bases. The Integrated Investment Program devotes $14 to $18 billion over the decade to enhancement of bases, from the Cocos Keeling Island airfield through Darwin and Tyndall to RAF base Sherga in far north Queensland. <coughs> 3.6 to $3.8 billion over the decade is seeing the establishment of the Advanced Strategic Capabilities Accelerator. ASCA will ensure that Australia remains at the cutting edge of military technology and asymmetric military developments. Cyber is now a critical domain of conflict. Through both the ADF and the Australian Signals Directorate, Australia genuinely does punch above our weight in this domain. A further commitment of 15 to $20 billion over the decade will ensure that Australia builds this capability such that we remain at the forefront of developments in the cyber domain. And we've all seen the prevalence of drones in combat, including in Ukraine and the Red Sea. So we're increasing funding for Australian drone and counter drone capabilities. To make this happen, we are providing an additional 300 million over the next four years and $1.1 billion over the decade. Reallocating spending cannot occur without difficult decisions. Just as important as what we are doing are the decisions we have taken about what we are not. Meaningful change and meaningful focus cannot happen without meaningful choices. To proceed on the basis that we can do it all when no government has ever funded it all is both a fantasy and it's dishonest. But most critically, a weakness in not being able to make a difficult decision fundamentally compromises strategic planning. In the government's response to the Defence Strategic Review last year, we announced the reduction in the number of infantry fighting vehicles from 450 down to 129. This was on the basis that there was no capacity to ever move 
450 infantry fighting vehicles off our shores. This meant they would never contribute to Australia's ability to project. This is just one example of the decisions that we have been prepared to take. We're taking $1.4 billion from planned enhancements to defence facilities across Canberra and reinvesting this in our operational bases, including northern base infrastructure such as those at RAF bases as Darwin, Townsville and Learmonth. Defence had planned to acquire two large support vessels to increase the capacity of our Navy's sea lift and refuelling support. The focus on improving our maritime lethality means these support vessels are no longer a priority. This action will generate savings of $120 million over the next four years and $4.1 billion over the decade. These are all examples of difficult decisions to delay projects, reduce the scope of projects, to cancel projects. Of vital importance, these decisions will see the over-programming of the integrated investment program come down to manageable levels. We are now heading to that sweet spot of 20% over-programming and with it, a defence budget which is under control. After a decade of negligent defence budgeting under the coalition, which robbed our defence establishment of the ability to plan and acquire critical capabilities on schedule, the government has regained agency over the nation's fundamental security. But overall, we are increasing the defence budget, and today I can announce that the government will provide a further billion dollars for defence capability over the next four years. This additional funding will provide for further investments in the near term that will go towards accelerating long-range fires, in particular the earlier purchase of the Precision Strike Missile. It includes over $200 million to enable defence to go after more cutting-edge, asymmetric robotic and autonomous systems so they can be tested and deployed in the field earlier. And this includes autonomous aerial munition delivery vehicles, Blue Bottle, an uncrewed surface vessel, and Ghost Shark, an extra-large autonomous underwater vehicle and a great example of Australian defence industry innovation. This funding will allow Defence to uplift long overdue upgrades to its theatre logistics, like storage, logistics networks and infrastructure to be ready in times of need. And it will go towards enhancing our fuel resilience, particularly across our northern bases. Now, not all of these investments will be headline grabbing, but they are also the kinds of necessary investments that cannot be delivered quickly when you need them most. Almost two years into this job, let me tell you that the centre of strategic policy is defence funding. History will judge us not by what we say, but by what we do. And you can only do if you properly fund. In last year's budget, we announced an additional $30.5 billion in defence spending over the decade. Some have argued this is not real, but this is funding that has been contested and decided through all the Cabinet processes. And accordingly, the first tranche of this $3 billion will appear in the forward estimates of this year's budget. This year, on 20 February, the Government announced it will provide an additional $11.1 billion over the next decade to deliver an enhanced surface combatant fleet, including $1.7 billion over the next four years including today's announcement of an additional billion dollars in defence spending, the total increases in defence funding since the Albanese government came to office has been $5.7 billion over the next four years to 27-28 and over $50 billion over the next decade to 33-34 compared to the previous government's plan for the exact same period. This financial year Spending in defence will be $53 billion. These increases will see annual defence spending almost double over the next 10 years to $100 billion in the financial year 33-34. It will see defence spending as a proportion of gross domestic product projected to increase to around 2.4% 
by 2033-34. Prior to the government commissioning the Defence Strategic Review in 2022, the previous trajectory of the defence budget over the same period was to plateau at around 2.1 per cent of GDP. Putting aside adjustments like foreign exchange and operations, the additional $5.7 billion will be the biggest lift in defence expenditure over a forward estimates period in decades. The growth from 2 per cent to around 2.4 per cent of GDP in defence spending is the largest growth since defence spending went from 2 to 5 per cent between 1949 and 1953 as Australia engaged in the Korean War. But taken over a 10-year period, it will be the largest sustained growth in the defence budget since the Second World War. Now, these are facts which have been and will be in the budget. And it doesn't matter how often the Liberal Party or their cheer squad try to deny them, they will remain the facts of Australia's strategic policy under the Albanese government. Rather than deny them, it really is time for the Liberals to commit to them. Because as it stands, the level of defence spending in Australia is not bipartisan. The Liberals remain stuck in 2022 and a policy of spending 2.1 per cent of GDP on defence. When the Albanese government came to office, we inherited a mess. A defence budget that included $42 billion of spending commitments without the provision of a single dollar. Over-programming, which was on track to average around 36 per cent over the next four years. 28 major projects running a total of 97 years over time. The coalition being in and out of a submarine deal with Japan and then in and out of a submarine deal with France had seen a 10-year capability gap open up on our most important and potent military platform. The Royal Australian Navy's surface fleet was the oldest since the end of the Second World War. The ADF was shrinking in size. We saw six, really seven, different defence ministers in nine years, with defence ministers churning at a rate of one every 18 months. There was no consistency in government action, a strategic void, a lost decade. The Liberals were one of the worst defence governments in our nation's history at a time when Australia could least afford it. Over the last two years, our government has taken AUKUS from a concept and turned it into reality. The acquisition of the Virginia-class submarines from the United States a decade earlier than planned has closed the capability gap on our future submarines. <clears throat> the decision to operate the same future class of submarines with the United Kingdom means we will be sharing the risk of the biggest industrial endeavour in our country's history. Infrastructure at HMAS Stirling in Perth and the Osborne Naval Shipyard in Adelaide is being built today. The Australian Submarine Agency exists today. Australian submariners are being trained to operate our future nuclear-powered submarines in the US today. Our industrial workforce, which will maintain and build our submarines, is being trained in the US and the UK today. And the sovereign submarine partners that will build and maintain our future submarines have been chosen and are up and running today. We commissioned and we delivered the biggest reassessment of our strategic circumstances in 35 years through the Defence Strategic Review. And this in turn has seen a restructuring of the Australian Army and the first real funding for a domestic guided weapons and explosive ordnance enterprise. We have fully funded a plan for a future surface fleet which more than doubles the current size of our Navy's surface combatant fleet. We are revitalising our international defence relationships from Korea to the Philippines, from Japan to Indonesia, from the UK and France to India. We have put the Pacific at the heart of our strategic policy, which is where it belongs. And we have deepened relationships with New Zealand, Singapore and, of course, the United States. 
legislation to establish a seamless defence industrial base between the United States and Australia has passed the US Congress and our own parliament. Breaking down these barriers had been a generational dream. Now it is done. For the first time, we've articulated the kind of defence industry we will need to underpin our future force through the defence industry development strategy. We have responded to the interim findings of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide, and we are committed to fulfilling the promise of the Royal Commission by following through on improving defence force culture. And later this year, we will move forward on the biggest reform to the defence estate in memory. And importantly, these reforms have come with the biggest increases in defence funding in decades. I am very fortunate and privileged to work alongside Pat Conroy, Matt Keogh and Matt Thistlethwaite in the defence portfolio. Together I believe we have overseen a dramatic period of defence reform in the first two years of the Albanese government. And in a very difficult world, this consistent vision, backed up by meaningful action and real funding, gives Australia genuine agency over our future security. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister, for that speech with so much detail in it. We have about 15 questions, at least, from the journalists here. We've only got less than half an hour, so we're hoping to move quickly through them. I'll start the questions with one that touches on some of the theme there at the end of your remarks about what's being done today, because my question is about speed. You've been in office for about two years. The general purpose frigates are yet to be chosen. You've had the Defence Strategic Review, you've had a review after that, and subsequent work, you've got four options. Is that an example of defence being too slow at actually making commitments and getting things moving? When can we expect the general purpose frigates in the water? Uh, well, um, thank you for that question. I mean, in respect to the general purpose frigates specifically, um, they, we will have the first of those in the water in this decade. Um, and we have brought forward the acquisition of them. Um, and, and the means by which we have done that is by making clear that we will uh, purchase the or procure the first of those through an overseas build of an existing frigate, which is in service right now. I mean, that represents one of the preconditions of um, the, the tender that we will operate. Uh, and what we are seeking uh, is in doing that to acquire for our Navy a capability which is the minimum viable capability in order to perform the task that we seek. A minimum viable capability uh, which is a really important philosophy that was expounded in the Defence Strategic Review, is utterly central to getting uh, new platforms into service quicker. I mean, it is right to say that um, we have to speed up defence processes. We need to make sure that we get um, the cutting-edge technology and the cutting-edge platforms into service more quickly. Um, and that is why we are making the decisions that we've made around that procurement more general, uh, about that procurement specifically. More generally, um, I think the point that I'd, I'd want to make is this. I've tried to describe it in terms of um, what our strategic challenge is. You know, we have commentators out there who would talk about our defence force needing to acquire everything yesterday in case of the worst case contingency that might be experienced in terms of great power contest in the next few years. I mean, obviously, uh, if, you, if one spends 10 seconds thinking about this, as a medium power, we are never going to bring to bear um, the kind of military capability that exists in the United States or China. Now, our strategic challenge is not trying to be a peer of the United States or China. The strategic problem that we are trying to meet, that we are trying to solve, is making sure that in a much less certain world in the future, we are able to resist coercion and maintain Australia's way of life. That is the strategic cat that we are trying to skin. And what that means is that our focus is on making sure that we have 
we are bringing to bear the kind of capabilities that will enable us to do that um, in uh, you know, a decade from now and beyond. That is the challenge that, is that we face and that is the challenge that we're meeting. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Andrew Green and I remind everybody to keep it to one question. We've got to move through as many questions as we can. Thanks, Andrew. Defence Minister, it's been something like 783 days since Russia began its illegal invasion of Ukraine. Since Labor's been in office, Australia's fallen from being the most significant non-NATO contributor to about fifth place behind countries like Japan and Korea. We've also turned down requests for things like coal exports and specific military equipment. How can defence industry trust what you've unveiled today if a country that is already under attack is seeing Australia's support diminish? Uh, well, Australia continues to support Ukraine. Let me be clear about that. Um, our support is north of $700 million uh, in military assistance, closing in on a billion dollars in terms of overall assistance. Um, and we will continue to play our part. Um, and as we announced um, when uh, the UK Defence and Foreign Secretaries were in Australia a few weeks ago, Australia will participate in the, in the drone coalition um, in support of Ukraine. Recently, we've made an additional commitment of $50 million to the UK's support fund for Ukraine. Uh, and we will continue to stand with Ukraine. As I said in my speech, we understand that we exist in a broader context. Um, and that when the global rules-based order is under threat in Ukraine, which it most certainly is by the appalling invasion of Russia into Ukraine, um, that is an issue which engages our national interest because we are entirely invested in the global rules-based order. Um, so we will continue to support Ukraine um, as we have. Um, it is also the case, as I said, that we will maintain a focus on our region and on the, uh, the, the strategic challenges that we face here. That is the call of the Defence Strategic Review, uh, and we are adhering to that. And we have absolute challenges that we face right now on our doorstep, and that has to be our primary focus. Next question is from Tom Connell. Thanks, Minister. Just looking at the overall spend on the integrated investment program, so the, it's budgeted in this document, it says the budget is $330 billion over the decade, but the planned investment actually has a, a, a broader amount given, $330 billion up to $420 billion, so $90 billion extra dollars. Does that mean you and the next nine coalition defence ministers will have to each year justify what has always been overspend on defence projects, or will we have a continued line item every year in the budget? Here's how much we overspent on defence. That means the budget's worse off. Uh, well, I guess if I can address the question of, of, of over-programming, uh, which is really um, the issue that we face here, um, it is really important that we get over-programming levels down. I mean, what we inherited um, was a practice that had been engaged by the former Liberal government to make all sorts of promises, uh, all sorts of commitments, without putting any money behind them. I mean, they announced a $35 billion guided weapons and ordnance enterprise uh, and assigned $1 billion towards it. Um, so much of what we saw was, in fact, nothing more than hoopla and fantasy. Um, and what it meant was that the overprogramming levels were at such a degree that it made it almost impossible for defence to properly plan. And so that is why um, we have, in the work that we've done, in not just reprioritising spending within the integrated investment program, but actually getting those overprogramming levels down, we've done that so that we can actually manage the defence budget um, in a way where we can fulfil our strategic objective. Um, and so that is what we are doing, and there's been very difficult decisions that we've had to take in order to do that. I think the other point to make is you will see a range in the numbers that are in the integrated investment program. Um, that's, that's there for good reason. Uh, yeah, in part it's about having a contingency in place. Um, there's also commercial and confidence. I mean, were we to publish specific numbers in respect of all of those items, it would place defence at an enormous disadvantage in the way in which it procured what it needs. And that's why, in fact, uh, ranges have been published in relation to the integrated investment program for very good reason uh, over a long period of time. But fundamentally, we are committed to getting those over programming levels down, and we need to. Next question is from Ben Packham. 
Uh, thank you, Minister. Ben Packham from The Australian. Um, so you're putting in $5 billion more over the forwards. Um, uh, that's uh, roughly 10% of a single year's defence budget. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's probably 2.5% over the forwards. Um, if strategic circumstances uh, have worsened over the past two months, why so little? Uh, and how much is eaten up by inflation and currency movements? <laughs> um, well, Ben, it's 5.7. Um, and I've, you know, I accept that you know, often we're talking about large numbers um, which are difficult to contextualise, which is why I've taken some time to try and do exactly that. Um, you can judge us by some abstract perfect, uh, or you can judge us by history and what's happened in the past. This is the biggest commitment in terms of increasing the defence budget over the forward estimates in decades. So you can describe it in the way in which you have, but it flies in the face of uh, the decisions that have had to have been made by defence ministers for decades and decades. $5.7 billion over the forwards as an increase in the defence budget is a historically very large number. And there is no escaping that, no matter how one tries to characterise it. Um, that is what we are doing. And it is a reflection of the strategic circumstances that we face. Taking defence spending from 2%, which is about what it is now, to 2.4% of GDP over the course of the next decade, that is money which is in the budget, which has been contested and decided through all the Cabinet processes, which is being reflected in the forward estimates in this year's budget this year. That growth over that period of time is the most sustained growth in the defence budget since the Second World War. So again, you can characterise it in whatever terms you want, but that is the historical fact. In historical terms, this is large. But the real point is this, Ben. <coughs> that, that, <coughs> excuse me, that is where we have defence spending now. That's the decision that this government has made. That's what stands in stark contrast to what we inherited. The, 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 the decision really is now for the Liberals, because these things happen over a long period of time. For uh, the people in this room, for the Australian public, to have a sense of confidence that that will occur, there needs to be bipartisan support around it, and right now there is not. Right now this question actually lies with Peter Dutton and Angus Taylor, because they stubbornly ass uh, assert that where they have defence spending is at the, pro the envelope they took to the last election, which would be 2.1 per cent of GDP over the same period of time. Sorry, just following up on the second part, on inflation, though. We're going to go to Anna Henderson. What, what proportion is inflation? Well, the, 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 the $5.7 billion um, is, is additional money, and, and the, the historic context that I've given you um, is, is taking into account uh, exchange variations that we've seen over that period of time. Anna Henderson, thank you. Thank you, Anna Henderson, SBS News. Uh, you're the Deputy Prime Minister and a member of the National Security Committee. So earlier this week, you were part of the group that decided to embrace the New South Wales Police decision to call the, the stabbing in Sydney a terrorist incident. Uh, local member Di Lee and other faith leaders say this has only served to stir up dissent and community tension. What was the justification for labelling it with that label so quickly and do you also, as a result of this concern, acknowledge that it could well stir up that community concern and further tensions? Uh, look, we um, acknowledge um, the, um, the call that the New South Wales Police made in respect of this incident, and we support it. There's nothing further you'd like to add about the justification? Well, I mean, the, the New South Wales Police uh, were the, the, the police force at hand, which had all the facts in their possession um, and which characterised this in, in those terms. Um, and all, that we, all the information we received uh, backs up the information that the New South Wales Police had and the call that they've made, and we support it. Thank you. Next question is from Matthew Knott. Thank you for your speech, Minister. You mentioned uh, in your address about uh, expanding the number of ADF personnel and about expanding it to uh, non-citizens. Could you provide a bit more detail on that? Uh, it has been discussed, the idea of uh, enlisting Pacific Islanders or perhaps members of the Five Eyes Nations, but we don't have any detail from the government. And how far could that go? How many numbers of people could we be talking about there? 
Yeah, good question. I mean, so I think you should read what I've said today um, and what's in the National Defence Strategy as opening this door. Um, and uh, you know, there are questions and issues that we would need to work through in respect of any category of uh, non-Australian citizens that might enter into the Australian Defence Force. But I think the important thing is we've got to start looking at this. Um, I mean, an obvious place to start looking is amongst AUKUS partners or Five Eyes partners. Um, I think I'll, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but there are 600,000 Kiwis who live in Australia right now. Again, that's, that, that is another obvious place for us to look to. Um, we, we are thinking um, about ways in which we can involve the Australia's Pacific family more um, in our Defence Force work, and there is certainly an interest around the Pacific in respect of that. Uh, now, as I say, there's, there's issues in relation to each of those uh, categories and groups of people, but this is a Rubicon that has been crossed by uh, the defence forces of our friends and allies. You'll see Nepalese and uh, Fijians serving in the British Armed Forces. You'll see Micronesians um, serving in the US Armed Forces. So uh, it is a, 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 a bridge that's been crossed by others. Um, we do have a significant workforce challenge, uh, which I've articulated. We are starting to turn that around in terms of recruitment and retention of those currently in the force, but it's not just a matter of maintaining the current numbers in the force. We need to grow the force through to 2040, and to do that, we, I think, need to be thinking about these um, avenues and, and this wider pool of people that we can draw from. Next question is from Tess Economou. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, you've committed to improving culture and that the workforce plan will be informed by the Royal Commission. Uh, just touching on <coughs> retention and recruitment problems in the military, do you accept that the issues raised have caused them? In the Royal Commission? Yep. Uh, I think the Royal Commission has... Um, ..exposed challenging um, evidence and, and facts for, um, for the Defence Force. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, and we take the work of the Royal Commission really seriously. Um, you know, it's very important work. And um, I acknowledge Matt Keogh, who's in the room today, who's been leading our response uh, to the recommendations of the Royal Commission. But not for a second would I seek to um, diminish the evidence and the testimony that's been provided by so many people to the Royal Commission and the, um, the stories that have been told there and the picture that it paints. Um, it is really important uh, that we have culture operating at the highest possible level. Um, culture that is befitting a very unique uh, workplace, uh, but culture which encourages people to participate in it across the full breadth of the diversity of Australian society, because we need to be in draw drawing on that entire talent pool if we're going to have the numbers that we need to have. Um, we see there are many lessons that we can be learning from the Royal Commission. Um, you know, that's evidenced in the way in which we have implemented the interim recommendations of the Royal Commission report, Royal Commission already. We look very much forward to the final report of the Royal Commission and, as I said to the Royal Commission itself, uh, we are utterly committed uh, to adopting the thrust of the recommendations which come from the Royal Commission. Thank you. Before we go to the next question, I have one on the phone here. It's from Andrew Tillett, the defence correspondent at the Australian Financial Review, who was going to be sitting in this chair before he got COVID. So <laughs> I'm going to ask his question for him, I uh, Deputy PM. Um, and here it is. US Ambassador Carolyn Kennedy has told a conference in Perth today that Australian resources companies providing raw materials for batteries are, in quotes, under assault from state-owned Chinese companies in Indonesia. So how concerned are you about the national security and economic implications of this? Is it, is it true that those companies are under assault from China? Uh, well, firstly, I wish Andrew all the best in his recovery, having just walked this journey myself uh, at the end of, end of last week. Um, I think the way I'd answer this is that our critical um, minerals industry, our rare earths industry, our mining, our resources sector is, is really important for uh, the country's economy, but it's really important for the country's security. In the National Defence Strategy, and indeed in the Defence Strategic Review, there 
is an idea which is articulated of national defence, an idea which says that whilst uh, the ADF is very central to our nation's defence, it's, 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 it's by no means the totality of our national defence. National defence needs to be thought of across the whole gamut of Australian society um, and across the whole gamut of Australian statecraft. That includes uh, our diplomacy, for example, but it very much includes our industrial base in this country and the resilience of our supply chains. Um, these companies are fundamentally important um, for Australia's future. The resilience of our resources sector, our participation uh, in critical minerals and rare earths is absolutely central uh, to, I think, the role that we can play more globally, but is absolutely central to our prosperity but also our national resilience and therefore our security, uh, and we are very mindful of them. Next question is from Andrew Proben. Mr Andrew Proben, perhaps I should have called in my question. Yeah, a bit of a tickle. Um, <laughs> go well, Mr Tillett. Um, Minister, you said today um, that Australia no longer had the luxury of a 10-year window of strategic warning time for conflict. Sounds a bit scary. How much time do we have and given that it seems to be well under 10 years, do you concede that having a greater missile capacity is a much more valuable strategic deterrent than the nuclear subs will be? Uh, well, again, it, 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 I mean, both are deterrent is the, is the answer to that question. Uh, but again, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's a really good question, but it's, it, it, it goes to the heart of how we need to conceptualise our strategic challenge. Um, yeah, we, 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 I mean, really going back to the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, uh, we had for the first time an assessment that we sit within uh, the 10 year threat window. I mean, if anything else, um, what that must demand of us is urgency and focus. And both of those concepts are central to the Defence Strategic Review and now the National Defence Strategy and have to inform the decisions that we make. You know, like it really does mean that we have to be focused on making sure that we are. Uh, dealing with our region and bringing to bear what resources we have for our region. Um, the, we need g drilling into that a bit further to be particularly focused, as we are, on bringing to bear newer capabilities which will enable us in a much less certain future in uh, much less certain world in the future to be able to resist coercion um, and maintain our way of life that is what we are trying to do with our defense force and, and in that sense having nuclear powered submarines in the 2030s and beyond will be fundamentally uh, important to that. I mean, it, 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 I, I do think that they will be the single most important military platform that we bring to Minister, bear. Minister, how long but, have but, we got? You, but, you said it's well, under 10 years. Uh, 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 Bringing to bear, though, um, deterrence is really important, and longer-range strike is, is, is part of this as well. And that's why, you know, I've articulated a whole range of longer-range missiles that we will we will bring to bear. I mean, the answer to your question is we need to be doing this as soon as we can. Uh, none of this happens overnight, but in preference to extending existing platforms today versus acquiring new platforms that we can have up and running um, in the next 10 years. We choose the latter. We choose the latter because it is that strategic problem that we are trying to solve. And there may be four questions from Andrew Proben later, but right now we have Daniel Hurst. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Shortly after you were sworn in as Minister for Defence, you said about acting on the Brereton inquiry into alleged war crimes by Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan. History will judge us. It's really important that there's follow through and that it's fully implemented, and I'm deeply committed to that. Uh, on the 15th of May last year, General Campbell, the Defence Chief, provided you with advice about holding commanders accountable, including whether to cancel any honours or awards. It's now been 11 months. Why has it taken so long to make a decision on this? And what specific problems are you trying to work through before you'll be in a position to advise the Governor-General? Uh, well, well, first I stand by all the comments that I made um, having uh, immediately after the election in relation to the Brereton Report. I mean, the Brereton Report was... Um, a hugely significant piece of work in response to you know, app appalling allegations. Um, and um, in the face of those appalling allegations, I think the Brereton report and its recommendations 
offered um, kind of a defining opportunity for our nation uh, to, to do right um, in, in, in the face of wrong. Um, I really want to acknowledge uh, General Angus Campbell in the way in which he um, handled this um, with, I think, enormous bravery um, in asserting that we need to be following through um, to the fullest possible extent the recommendations of Brereton, and we are utterly committed to doing that. Now, you know, it, it, we, you're right in the timing that you have uh, described. We will. Uh, uh, those are on my desk now and, and are very much front and centre, and we will complete that work. Uh, but can I just say, timing in respect of that is not as important as thoroughness and getting those decisions right. Uh, and, and, that, and so that is what I am focused on. We will take the time to do this thoroughly, to get it right, but we will get it done because history will judge us on the extent to which we follow through on Brereton um, and we mean to do that fully. Will you complete that work this year? Uh, I'm not going to put a timing on it, but we, we, what we will do is complete it thoroughly and we will get those decisions right. Next question is from Ben Westcott. Thank you very much for your speech, Minister. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Ben Packman and Andrew Probum's questions. Every government minister and close Australian ally has emphasised the difficult strategic times we find ourselves in. You yourself said we've lost the 10-year strategic window, and yet we find ourselves with a military which is not fit for purpose, according to the Defence Strategic Review, and about 90% of the funding you've announced today doesn't come in for about half a decade. Now, the AUKUS subs don't get here till the 2030s, neither do the six large, optimally crewed surface vessels, so to read from your own IAP document, only in 2031 and beyond do we find the delivery of an ADF that is fit for purpose across all domains and enablers. How can we afford to wait so long? Well, um, I mean, there's an old truism, um, which is that the best time to have acted on all of this would have been 10, 20 years ago. Um, but the second best time to act on it is now. Um, and that's the reality of, of what we face. Um, I mean, in many respects, the questions that you're directing to me now, given the lead times in defence, are properly answered by those who were governing a decade ago, and that wasn't us. Um, you know, we inherited the circumstances that we found and we are dealing with them now. But I want to say that in, in dealing with the urgency of the moment and reiterate the point I made to Andrew, um, you, you could be faced with trying to extend the life in the next two or three years of what assets that we've got, pumping a whole lot of money into sustaining those, or making sure that we acquire new capabilities to put us in a transformationally different position a decade from now, and we choose that. We choose that because that is the strategic problem that we are trying to solve. You know, those commentators who suggest that we're going to be playing some big part in the worst contingency that may or may not occur in the next few years, it lacks wit. Like, it genuinely lacks wit. There's no analysis in that. Because we will never be a peer to the United States or China. Right? That's not what we're trying to do. But in a much less certain world in the future, which is possible, we need to make sure that we have transformational capability in place so we can resist coercion and maintain our way of life. That is the strategic cat that we are trying to skin. And I do think that we can do that over the time that we have. Now, in saying that, there's no waiting. Like, what we are doing with the new general purpose frigate will be the single fastest acquisition of a capability of that kind that we've seen. Like, we've said we will bring that into service this decade, dramatically bringing forward that capability, and that requires the difficult decision of accepting that that will be done through an overseas build initially albeit beyond that, we seek to have those uh, platforms built in Australia. We are doing that through adopting uh, a, a philosophy of minimum viable capability. You know, too often what we've seen in the past is procurements where people seek to have all the bells and whistles put on top, and that is a recipe for ensuring that we go beyond budget and beyond time and we don't have a capability at all. So we are doing minimum viable capability. There is no waiting. You know, we are getting this done as quickly as humanly possible, given the mess we inherited. Next question is from King Burpin. Uh, thank you, Minister. I refer to the $13 billion that you've committed over the next, next decade for nuclear-powered submarines. Now, if I understand, a full one-third of that, $4.7 billion, is the impending transfer to 
the US submarine building industry. Can you explain how that figure was calculated? And is it a coincidence that that's almost exactly the same amount that you've committed to giving to the UK submarine building industry? Um, well, uh, let's be clear. We, we, we are making a commitment um, to both the US and the UK industrial base. Um, we are doing that um, for, for differing reasons in the two countries in respect of the US. Uh, by enabling them to increase their production rate of Virginia-class submarines and their sustainment rate, such that they are then in a position to be able to transfer Virginia-class submarines to Australia, which will see us having them in our Navy from the early 2030s. That, that, that's getting a nuclear-powered submarine up and running in the Royal Australian Navy 10 years ahead of what we inherited when we came to office in 2022. In respect of the UK, um, by running uh, what will be a joint class of submarine with the United Kingdom, uh, that is going to mean that Rolls-Royce's production facility, which will be making the nuclear reactors for both the submarines being built in Barrow in the UK and in Adelaide in Australia, that they will need to be producing more nuclear reactors. That factory needs to expand as a result. So yes, we are putting money into both of those industrial bases for those reasons. But let's be clear, the vast bulk of the money that we're going to invest in industry is right here in Australia. You know, what we will build in Adelaide at the Osborne Naval Shipyard is going to be the highest tech, most complex manufacturing production line in Australia. It will be the single biggest industrial endeavour our country has ever undertaken. It will employ thousands of workers in Australia and provide enormous opportunities for small and medium-sized businesses across the country to supply into that. So you know, that is the reason we are making the decisions that we have. The amounts that we've provided to both the US and the UK are the, are the consequence of the negotiations that we've had with them. Uh, I think we've done well in terms of uh, the amounts we're providing, given what we're getting back in return, uh, but it, it really is the key uh, that unlocked the optimal pathway which allows us to see an evolution of our nuclear, well, of our submarine capability from what it is today through to when we're operating uh, eight nuclear powered submarines in the future. We've got a bit over time, but we still have enough time for two more questions. The next is from Anthony Galloway. Thank you, Anthony Galloway from Capital Brief. Um, you've declared we're moving from a balanced defence force uh, to a focused one, and you also mentioned that um, projecting deterrence isn't just about doing it from our coastline, but much further from home. Um, but um, does a lot of this plan, uh, is a lot of this plan predicated on the United States remaining deeply engaged in East Asia? And what are the contingencies uh, with the capabilities that we're committing to here for a much more complex region in which the US has disengaged? And it's not about forward defence in the Taiwan Strait or South China Sea. It's about projecting deterrence much closer to home. Uh, good question. Um, so, so I think the starting point is you know, we, we, what we've tried to do is the foundational thinking around what, what is it that is our challenge um, what sort of, what, what job do we need our Defence Force to do and what sort of an ADF do we need to have in order to do it? Like that, that's the pretty simple stuff, but that, that is the process that we have tried to work through. You know, what, what, we, what we see is that we have a deep economic connection to the world which has a physical manifestation to it, you know, the, our sea trade. Um, the example that I gave in the main speech really does try to describe that, that we have vulnerabilities associated with those sea lines of communication, which is actually the main game for us, uh, much more than it is to be thinking about any invasion of uh, the Australian continent. So the job our Defence Force needs to do is to be focused on that. That and the fact that when you look at our economic connection, it is largely with our region, and so the stability of our region is at both the heart of our national prosperity and our national security. And so again, a job of the Australian Defence Force is to contribute to the collective security of our region. Now, both those things are well beyond our shoreline. Both those things require us to have a capacity to project. And it's off the back of that that you then see all the decisions that we have made in terms of the kind of defence force that we are seeking to build. 
But on top of all of that, to go, I think, to the nub of your question, the assessment, you know, the strategic assessment of what the world looks like over the next decade and beyond is that it becomes precarious and less certain in every respect. And so what we need is a dramatic transformation in our capability in order to meet that. That's why we are talking about investing so much money in our defence. That's why we are talking about growing our defence budget in historic terms. That's why we've actually made the decisions to commit real money, not fantasy money, to that endeavour. It is precisely so that we can have genuine Australian capability to be able to meet that moment in that time frame. And that is what we are trying to do, becoming a much more capable, self-reliant country. And that, that starts with the investment and funding decisions that we've made. The last and very quick question, I'm afraid. Uh, the next one is Melissa Code. Thank you, Minister. I'm Melissa Code from the Mandarin. Thank you for eliminating some of the geostrategic um, requirements that Australia's national security faces. Given the national crisis that the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide also underscores, can you please tell us if this Labor government would be prepared to entertain the idea of independent oversight of suicidality and rates of suicide in defence, even if the defence and ADF bureaucracy don't believe that's the best way forward? Thank you for that question. Um, look, we're, we're um, obviously aware that um, this is an idea which the Royal Commission itself is, is, is thinking very carefully about. Um, and, uh, and they've spoken publicly about that, um, and I think spoken publicly about it here. Um, and, and, I, and the short answer really to this question is that we are um, going to look very carefully at the recommendations that come, that are made by the Royal Commission. We are very open to the recommendations that will be made by the Royal Commission clearly. In fact, more than that, um, we are committed to implementing the thrusts of those recommendations. But in relation to that specifically, you know, we are open to this idea, as I said to the Royal Commission itself. Uh, but, you know, without I don't seek to answer it conclusively now because I think the right thing to do is to actually see what the Royal Commission has to say, look at the model that it proposes, the rationale that it puts forward for that, and we'll give that very careful and due consideration. Thank you. Now, we've covered plenty of ground there and I will skip the longer wrap-up. I think suffice to say at this point, please join me in thanking Richard Marles. <laughs>